Chthonic deities have been a feature of mythology since the Bronze Age, but became particularly common in classical antiquity. Stories of treacherous journeys into the underworld were told orally, written in texts and imitated in plays. Could these myths have had their origins with the megalith builders of the Neolithic? Let's discuss. In Greek mythology, Persephone was known as the goddess of the grain, and as such was celebrated as a nature deity, representing renewal and spring. However, she was also sometimes referred to as the goddess of the underworld because of her abduction by Hades. In the myth, she is abducted by the god of the underworld because he is in love with her, something Zeus permits. Her mother Demeter searches all over for her lost daughter and is eventually told what has happened. Demeter avenges the abduction by causing a famine, which forces Zeus to tell Hades he must return Persephone. He agrees, but tricks her into eating some pomegranate seeds before she leaves, which means that she must still spend part of the year in the underworld, something she could have avoided if she hadn't have accepted them. In the Eleusinian mysteries, this abduction myth was a central feature of the ceremonies, plays and initiations that took place every year. Although the exact nature of these secretive rituals is not known with any certainty, the initiates are known to have drunk a substance referred to as the kukion, which many researchers think may have been an entheogenic substance causing an altered state of consciousness. A part of the sanctuary known as the telesterion was where the final phase of the ceremony took place, and it's thought this had an underground section, which would make sense given it was all about the reenactment of Persephone's journey into the underworld. Another ritual that was widespread in ancient Greece was incubation. This is where a person would go to a specific sanctuary or cave after having carried out certain preparations such as diet and sacrifices. They would then sleep there with the goal of receiving some sort of divinatory message in their dreams. There's a lot of research into incubation and it's a very complicated subject, but there is some idea that such magical rituals were linked with Chthonic deities as well. One site where incubation is known to have been practiced is Epidaurus on the Argolid Peninsula. So where am I going with this? This is not meant to be a detailed description or analysis of the extensive Chthonic deities and cults found in the Bronze Age and classical worlds. Not at this point, there are so many avenues we can go down with that. But I wanted to look at the connection between these rituals and some clues we have as to what was happening in the hypogeum of House Safflianian and Malta more than 5,000 years ago. Two key things need to be considered. Firstly, experts do not think the hypogeum was a burial ground, but a dual purpose site, including rituals that were not necessarily funerary in nature. Secondly, the sleeping lady figurine found in one of the underground chambers is unlike anything found in the above ground temple. So what does she represent? In his book, The Archaeology of Malta and Gozo, archaeologist Professor Bonanno wrote in a caption next to a photograph of the figurine, it may suggest the practice of the rite of incubation. Could the hypogym have been a site of divinatory dream rituals and other forms of initiation, perhaps similar to later mystery schools, all taking place underground due to their relationship with Chthonic deities. Let's look at the hypogym and see what we think. I did a video last year on the hypogym, but the sound had issues, so I will repeat some of the main stuff here, but I'm also including more things I've read about over the past few months. The hypogym of House Safliani dates back to 3300 BC and was contemporary with many of the earliest megalithic temples on the islands. These days it has a very sensitive environment. In the recent past, the artwork on the walls has found itself covered with bacteria and fungi, which means conservation and restoration are extremely important. For this reason, the number of visitors is limited to small groups on guided hour-long tours and tickets must be purchased in advance to secure a spot. Unfortunately, visitors are not allowed to take photographs, so when I talk about this site, I have to use what's available under a Creative Commons license online, and these are mostly black and white pictures from many years ago. However, I will illuminate the site as best I can. 
The hypogeum was first discovered in 1902 when construction work on a housing estate was being carried out. It's located in the town of Paola, known as Rahal Jadid in Maltese, which means new town. Unlike most other towns and villages in Malta, which had permanent settlements beginning in the high Middle Ages, Paola wasn't founded until the 17th century, the Knights period, when the Grand Master of the Order of St. John, Antoine de Paola, established the town as Casal Nuovo on a hill called Tal Arian. This hill name means of the caves in Maltese. Nowadays, the hypogeum is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is under a purpose-built museum which replaced houses over the top of it. The whole area is highly urbanised. However, when it was first built by the temple people more than 5,000 years ago, it would have stood out because it's known to have had a megalithic above-ground entrance at the time, which stood on a hill surrounded by countryside. The four Tarshin temples are around half a kilometre east of the hypogeum. It's one kilometre south of the Cordian III temple, a ruinous but interesting site accessed by appointment only, and one and a half kilometres south of the destroyed Cordian I and Cordian II temples. Interestingly, another hypogeum in the nearby village of Santa Lucia to the south was discovered in the 1970s. It's a lot smaller, has only been partially excavated, and is not open to the public. When it was first reported, a megalithic above-ground entrance was mentioned as existing there too, but this hasn't survived either. Hypogeum was first excavated by the priest and antiquarian Manuel Magri. Unfortunately, he died shortly after while visiting the Maltese community in Tunisia, and his notes were lost. The excavations were then picked up by the famous archaeologist Sir Temi Zamet and his team, who published their findings in several reports. The hypogeum is an extensive underground complex on three levels that was extended from natural caves. I don't know if the name of the hill the town was built on, Tal Erian, was named because this cavernous complex was actually known about in the early medieval period when the Maltese language first evolved. Could the hypogeum have been known about in oral tradition? Probably not. There's no cultural continuity between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age even, let alone the medieval period. Also, there are a lot of caves in Malta, so the name could apply to almost any in the area. Just a thought. But anyway, the middle level is the most ornately carved with trilithon and portal entrances. It's where several large chambers are located. One, known as the Holy of Holies, imitates the above ground temples in its appearance. And there's one known as the Oracle Room with a ceiling painted in red ochre spirals. During the winter solstice, natural light filters down through the upper level and shines on the facade of the imitation temple in the Holy of Holies, so it may have been created that way on purpose for astronomical reasons. The Oracle Room has acoustic properties with a double resonance of 70 Hz and 114 Hz. Both frequencies have been found to have an effect on brain activity, which could mean the hypogeum was used for chanting or some other ritual process needing sound. A niche in the wall may have been used to amplify this. What's rather interesting on this level is that windows and doorways connecting different chambers are too high to walk, climb or look through. One explanation is that the ground level was higher originally due to the accumulation of soil and bones, or that these windows and doorways were accessed via wooden steps which haven't survived. For me, it just adds to the mysterious feel of this underground labyrinth. Just as with the above ground temples, the hypogeum has tunnel-shaped holes on the sides of entrances and the so-called libation holes in the ground in certain places. I did a video called What Will Hold Megaliths For? where I go deeper into this to so take a look at that if you want to know more. One rather peculiar feature on this level is a two meter deep funnel shaped pit. Its function isn't known, but it has been referred to as a snake pit in the past, even though no serpentine symbolism has been a found connected with it. The lower level is 10 meters below ground. No bones or other finds were excavated from it. So it may simply have been a storage facility. I find it quite weird because the steps down to it don't go all the way to the bottom you could easily walk off the ledge by accident. It may be that wooden steps were once placed there, but I wondered when I first saw it if it had been the site of an underground river, so the entrance was more of a jetty. 
But if that were the case, it would have been a very short river because that first chamber isn't very big, so probably not. The art in the Hypogeum is nothing short of stunning. And that applies to the wall and ceiling decorations, as well as the pottery and figurines. No other megalithic building in Malta has such extensive painted decorations. There are incredible red ochre spirals, honeycombs, and checkerboard patterns. As with the above ground temples, there are megaliths with pitted decorations on them. There are also references in early papers on the Hypogeum to a six-fingered hand carving in a wall and a painting of a bull, both of which have disappeared. I read through Ridley's 1971 publication, The Megalithic Art of the Maltese Islands, where he describes the hand and the bull. According to him, the bull painting was 100 by 154 centimetres and looked as though it had been made by accident or on purpose when a section of red ochre spirals was, for reasons unknown, being wiped off. So it could be a lot later than the temple period and might not be reflective of bull symbolism at all. He also mentioned that the hand carving was really difficult to make out and might just be natural. However, it's also worth mentioning that one corpulent figurine statue dating to the Neolithic also had six fingers on it. Many axe-shaped pendants were excavated from the Hypogeum, along with a beautiful black plate decorated with long-horned bulls and goats. Apart from the sleeping lady figurine mentioned earlier, Another figurine of a person laying face down on a couch was found. It looks as though this person is sleeping as well. Whilst most statues and figurines from the Neolithic period depict a corpulent person of indeterminate sex, the sleeping lady shows a full-breasted figure. She wears a full pleated skirt and has a recessive hairline, both common features of Neolithic multi-statuary. The figurine is very detailed and has traces of red oak on it, in indicating that it was painted originally. Literature often refers to the thousands of bones discovered in the hypogeum and the dolichocephalic or elongated skulls. In actual fact, thousands of bones were not found. In the excavation notes, it was reported that a lot of bones were found in one small area, but were friable due to the damp soil surrounding them. So they mostly disintegrated on touch. It was estimated from this that a large volume of bones numbering thousands could have once existed throughout the hypogeum, but that these hadn't survived the difficult conditions. Based on the measurements in use at the time, Zamet reported that the 11 schools successfully excavated were dolichocephalic, which, since their discovery, has led people to think they might be of an alien species or a result of head binding, something that was practiced in ancient Peru and a few other places. However, according to modern day parameters for the analysis of schools, they are all sized normally, except for one that belonged to a person suffering from craniosynostosis. I went into this in great detail on my video where elongated schools really found in Malta, so I don't want to repeat it all here. Take a look at that if you'd like more information, including photographs taken of the schools in the early 20th century and photographs taken by me when they were on display at the National Museum of Archaeology in Valletta a few years ago. So when it comes to the idea of the Hypogeum as a burial ground, the general consensus is that it was a secondary site for the deposition of bones brought from elsewhere. There were also a few researchers who think the bones may have flooded into there by accident because they were found mixed with other artefacts in a huge soil deposit. But if we stick with the general consensus that the hypogeum did have somewhat of a funerary role, it seems likely that this was not its only function and that other rituals did take place there as well. So could this labyrinthine complex have been the site of a Neolithic Chthonic cult practicing rituals including incubation and possibly other divinatory practices? Perhaps they had their own early version of the Kukion, whatever that was, and maybe these rituals varied from whatever was happening above ground. I often think that the word ritual is used to explain things from the ancient past that we can't understand today and that a more practical interpretation probably exists but evades us. However, with the high regime of House Afliani, I do see a site steeped in ritual that may have formed the foundation for cult practices several thousand years later in the ancient Greek world. Of course, there's no direct connection between these cultures. We don't know where the temple people went when they abandoned the islands. Their population may have simply died out. But the possibility is enticing in any case. 
Let me know what you think in the comments. And by the way, the Hypogeum is also the site of some scary stories which have been largely debunked. I won't go into those here because I've already mentioned them in my previous video on the Hypogeum and they aren't related to the central theme of this episode. I may, however, do some shorts about them for fun. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. Come and find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter where I post photographs and reels of the places I visit. I've also got a website with further information on these places, megalithunter.com.